Welcome back everyone to the Longwood Senior Research Presentations here today. My name is Dalton Floyd and today my research partner is Shelby Rogers and we're going to be talking specifically about social media's impact on the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so to get even more in depth with it, our research topic is not only talking about social media's impact on it, but just um, how big of an impact that is. And as we all know, social media is a huge part of our lives. And uh, more specifically in the past year or two, it has served as a major um, major resource for the Black Lives Matter movement to sort of amplify their voice. So we were, we were really curious about this because we, we wanted to get um, more insight on it from, from some of our peers and from some, from some people in certain groups on social, plat uh, social media platforms like Facebook or Instagram and things like that and get their thoughts on just um, how, how, how much um, of an impact they think it really makes. So next slide, please. Um, our participants were, were informed beforehand that everything that we interviewed them about, all their answers and their identities, well, yeah, mainly their identities would be confidential um, and they would remain that way. And any interviews that we recorded would be saved on our Google Drives, uh, shared between myself and Shelby and that we would use them specifically for our research paper in this presentation um, for, for as long as we needed to up until May 15th. And so during our interview process, we interviewed eight uh, different participants. Each interview lasted anywhere between six to 15 minutes. And all the data was recorded through our um, audio devices and Zoom uh, especially and then they were stored on our Google Drives. And pretty much the main thing that we were looking for throughout all these interviews were any sort of reoccurring themes, um, any sort of things that they think that, think, um, ways that different social media platforms can improve or what they, what they think um, certain platforms do really well. Uh, next slide, please. So the first two themes that we thought of here um, and came up with after these interviews were over were uh, visual communication and then voice really matters on social media. So the first one here with visual communication is really utilizing visual communication on social media um, platforms is really severely underrated. Uh, participant participant five that we interviewed stated that infographics on um, these social media platforms are really, really beneficial compared to anything more in depth because they're really easy to share and um, sharing like the ability to share posts on things like Instagram and Facebook and platforms of that nature, they're really um, underutilized. And the more that the more that users do that, the more awareness will get out there about this whole movement. So the second thing that we thought of um, and was uh, sort of a big takeaway from our interviews was that voice matters. And at times, um, concerns were had about um, just who posts about these different movements on um, platforms like Instagram, specifically when last year the big the big trend was to um, put the black square on your Instagram account. And some people did view that as just a trend, even though that we all know that it really, it shouldn't be viewed that way. So um, participant six stated that uh, we really should be thinking about who we're consuming content from and taking that into account and just sort of, sort of um, keeping a clear head about it because some people did just do it to sort of quote unquote fit in. And we wanted to make sure that um, in the future people sort of think more about that. And um, yeah, it's, it's relevant because it's, it's not just a trend and um, it, it's not gonna be, um, shouldn't be viewed that way in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next theme that we had was trust in social media compared to mainstream media in which interviewers displayed more trust in the visuals and dialogue seen on social media. For example, participant three noted differences in intention and narrative specifically. And then the next theme is platforms need to take action. And this is focusing on the influence the social media platforms themselves play in the Black Lives Matter movement. And there were various opinions and ideas on how these platforms could um, take action. For example, participant one said separate page for activism. Participant six said combat filter bubbles. And then 
participant two said not enough so no action that these platforms could take could actually help the black lives matter movement um, this is relevant because this gives us more gives users more freedom to be very specific on the content that they consume daily next slide please Um, for the discussion, all participants consumed and reported content related to Black Lives Matter. All participants noted ways in which Black Lives Matter is successfully being spread on social media. And a majority of participants addressed the need for the narrative to be led by people of color and to maintain a voice on these social media platforms. And then lastly, the majority of our participants stated that social media platforms can play a role um, in improving their platforms and supporting Black Lives Matter, but um, more support from these platforms and as well as user awareness and strategy to best utilize the platform for supporting Black Lives Matter was the main things that we got out from this. Next slide, please. For our limitations, we had participants were not asked to explain or elaborate on key terms in reference to social media, for example, shadow banning. Um, also, participants were only Longwood students and there was just an insufficient sample size. Next slide, please. For future research, um, we recommend focus groups so participants can bounce various ideas off of each other. And then to increase the participation by getting various opinions on the use of social media as a platform for supporting Black Lives Matter. And then just to research the use and impact of social media on other social movements. Thank you. I'm Haley Byers, and for my research study, I am um, studying the impact of mental health on college students during the Our topic is how much of a news skeptic are you? 
Um, and this project was mainly to the attention of us because we wanted to understand just how much we were able to be able to do this topic and um, being able to understand just people's consensus on the media that they intake, as well as the source credibility of news sources that they have. Um, so we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so our topic was uh, a qualitative research study regarding social media users' perception of the source credibility of their news on social media platforms. Um, and the basis of this and the interest that revolved around this topic for us was trying to understand just how much people question the sources that they read on the media that they intake daily. Um, as for our research gap, our results did not give us a consensus on which platform had the best or worst credibility when it came to these perceptions. Um, and as a result, the question we seek to answer was how do different social media platforms or TV channels encourage curated news content? So we'll move on to Jordan next. All righty, um, our participants, um, we tried to have our participants uh, either from a link off of Snapchat or, sh or sh sharing the link on, on sites like Reddit. Um, <clears throat> our sample was mostly a convenience sample. Anybody who had the survey or had access towards the survey had, um, was able to, to, to be a part of our, our, uh, our research. Our survey was approximately 10 minutes uh, with 14 questions starting on April 28th of this year. And some interesting facts was um, it was 64% females with 30% males. And, and we had a larger um, so, so Instagram users than Snapchat users. And some words that were recurring in our survey were like news literacy, accuracy, and, and likelihood. All right, next slide, please. So the, three, the theoretical grounding that was used in our study was uses and gratification theory. Um, the reason we used uses and gratification theories was to explore and how and based on which motives recipients use the media, as well as which gratification attained thereat. Um, meaning that understanding how the potential motives that our respondents had when intaking their media helped us kind of get an idea on how the kind of responses that we would get. Um, therefore, we were able to formulate questions around these responses and also understand the gratifications that they receive when intaking these kinds of resources. All righty. And for our hypothesis, uh, we had two hypotheses. Our first one was that we wanted to see the interaction of, of whether or not frequent critical content was correlated uh, with less source credibility. And, are the, and after averaging our, our um, data from all the hypothesis, all the of all the individuals, our hypothesis was actually supported, and then for our hypothesis two, uh, did it, whether or not individuals who use Instagram over Snapchat or Snapchat over Instagram had a had a more um, had a more formulated algorithm uh, on them. And it turns out th that that hypothesis was not supported because our, our sample size in the experiment was not actually large enough. Uh, next slide, please. So to go into more detailed discussion uh, on news literacy, uh, it's definitely an important matter, but it's key to understand and question how easy it is to uh, achieve accurate information on these sources. 
And based on the findings, uh, one aspect showed that users who had a greater intake um, in political content on those social platforms uh, would be more subjective to receiving news that was not as accurate. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with the understanding that some users source credibility varies when it comes to the content that they intake. Um, our habits on the internet are tracked by cookies that take our personal information in as we go about our days. And uh, they give us things on our feeds that uh, may interest us and that um, information is sometimes influenced by third party overseer. Um, Jordan. Right. And with that, the internet is a wonderful place. However, you have to know where to go so that you can, you can have accurate information. Um, while our project was a, a success, uh, there were a couple limitations on, on our results. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our, our some of our limitations were that we only had 72 respondents and we're aiming for about 100. Uh, we were not able to achieve that. So it might have impacted our results a little bit. Um, with the result, there are a lot of uh, participants over the age of 24 and it was mostly women. So, we would need a more ideal um, scenario for testing. And we did not have our results say which app is more news credible. All right, next slide. Uh, to finalize, uh, so for further research, uh, social media and news influence is one aspect that needs to be looked into more. Uh, looking into how these platforms influence users through the sources they post uh, is beneficial. Um, another aspect is the political effect, which is another aspect of research, as looking into how a user's source credibility perception can potentially change depending on the social media that they use. And uh, lastly, researching into there being a set algorithm based on what the user intakes is another one. And it could also provide promising results in the future of this. And that concludes our findings.
I'm Haley Byers, and I'm going to be studying, my study was the impact of mental health of college students during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide. Um, my research topic was how do students communicate through Zoom effectively in order for their education to be considered adequate? The reason I studied this is during the COVID-19 pandemic, university students switched to online learning for a majority of their courses. Students have led, students have had to adjust to online learning for their courses, which has had change on how they learn. My research questions focused on does online education affect university students' health and how do students perceive online learning? So my literature review in theory, like, I had several academic studies, but some of them uh, focused on students' experiences through synchronized learning through like the main factors, like students' ability to communicate their course materials and study processes. Another one um, was how students in synchronous and asynchronous class attendance and the predictors of academic success. And then how university students' mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic specifically students who experience symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress. Next slide, please. Uh, the methodology, so my participants were eight university students between the ages of 18 and 24. The participants were a total of three males and five females. My pr procedures were um, asking the participants nine questions on Zoom, each question, each interview lasted between 12 and 18 minutes. And I used the data from Zoom to transcribe it for my research study. And analyzing the data, I found that there are common, there are words used repetitively. These words were like stress, anxiety, and mostly grades. So for my results, for my first theme was online education, academic success. Uh, the students found that higher level courses were harder to do online. For my second theme, mental health and education during COVID-19, one participant said, I feel like I'm always behind on stuff. I've slept far less and it's been hard for me to feel like I'm on a schedule. This uh, is relevant as students' self-care and mental health has declined during online learning. Next slide. Uh, and my last theme was university helpfulness amidst the pandemic. One participant said that according to the university helpfulness, not really for some courses that I've had, I felt completely overwhelmed and confused as, and it was hard for me to get help. This was relevant as students felt a decrease in help from coping during online learning, leading to confusion and stress. Next slide. Uh, so the discussion for this was this research study provides an insight into mental health of the of university students during online learning due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The results show that the impacts of online learning on university students, specifically students' attitudes. Participants' response to the interview question gives insights to mental health and academic success during the COVID-19 pandemic and online learning. Next slide. Uh, so the limitations was participant variety. Um, the study only used eight participants, so it was difficult to gain like a variation of results. Uh, class variation, students were taking a variation of courses, so uh, this could affect students' perception of online learning for like harder courses, whether it's in science or math or other courses that are easier. And then face-to-face -face inter interviews. It was difficult to observe physical responses from participants since the interviews were conducted over Zoom. Next. Uh, and so for future research, focus on students who do all their courses online. Some, course, some students have like a mixture of courses, which some are online and some are in person. And then the other, for other future research is what major was most difficult for online learning. The study provided results from participants from a variety of all majors using participants of specific majors to provide attitudes in online learning. And that is it. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Victoria Coleman, and my partner is Brandon Fenters. Um, and our topic is women's um, how women perceive their safety on college campuses against sexual violence. Um, to start in society, or next slide, please. Um, in society, women are the more likely victim of sexual violence, and the same applies on college campuses. In fact, one in five women will be sexually assaulted while uh, attending college. Facts like these could cause uh, women to feel unsafe and uh, against sexual misconduct. And it is important, important to determine if this is so because those feelings of insecurity can lead to negative things such as impacted mental health and um, poor performance in the classroom. This reflects negatively on the student, which is unfair and ultimately unequal and should be something that universities uh, should strive to prevent. And moving on, there is a gap in our research. Uh, we, in, in the research that we analyzed, um, because none of them addressed a circumstance like the pandemic and how something like that could hugely impact campus life and thus impact how a woman perceives her own safety um, on college campuses. And ultimately our research question is how safe do female college students feel on college campuses against sexual offenses? Next slide, please. Um, to uh, moving on, uh, this is our methodology. First, we had to acquire participants. The people we interviewed were women who were enrolled in college and had some form of campus life. And um, we got volunteers to participate in interviews um, and our volunteers were to remain confidential. We interviewed 10 women via Zoom and each interview lasted approximately 10 minutes. And then we um, transcribed their responses. And based on their transcriptions, we were able to identify consensus and themes based on repetition, keywords, and forcefulness. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at our results. The women that we interviewed felt comfortable with co-ed housing, but wanted the option to choose to live on an all-female floor. Students were also extremely more likely to feel unsafe whenever it was poorly lit on campus. Uh, for example, when it's late at night or early in the morning. One said, my campus is very dark at night, so if I have to go out at night, I go with friends. I also carry pepper spray with me. Women were also not regularly informed of the resources at their disposal. Education and re-education is key to improve a feeling of safety on campus for students. Education also helps to define consent. The students that we interviewed became less and less aware of their resources as they advanced their academic career, unless, of course, they were involved in an extracurricular activity that requires re-education. Uh, one woman we interviewed said, I mean, my school could definitely do a better job of education, I only know about this stuff because I'm employed by them. Next slide, please. Um, to continue, in addition to lack of awareness of resources on campus, most women felt that the resources that were available were not adequate. Many universities' only installation to handle sexual harassment and assault issues is the Title IX office. However, in 2020, Title IX amended their policy to state that in order for a victim to have a legitimate case, the incident must be severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive. Before this amendment, the incident only had to cover one of those um, keywords. And um, in order for the perpetrator to be convicted of the crime and any, and any punishment to be dealt, they have to admit the crime in an official hearing. Um, one participant states that there was an issue with her school organization where an upperclassman male was harassing multiple of the women involved in the organization and those students came forward to the school, but nothing um, was, nothing happened to the person who continued to harass the students and now he's actually up for a job to work in the organization after he graduates. So um, similarly, most women do not feel comfortable going to university police due to feeling their cases will not be properly investigated. Many participants noted that they knew someone who went forward with a sexual assault case and nothing happened um, as a result. Next slide, please. Overall, students felt uncomfortable for a few reasons. There were either external factors or a lack of education, uh, access to education, or a distrust for existing resources. Students felt uninformed uh, with no re-education on the topic for upperclassmen. They also felt unsafe during low visibility hours 
and wanted more of a say in their housing. They also felt unprotected by Title IX and viewed university police as ineffective in cases of sexual misconduct. Next slide, please. So for our limitations, there were a few limitations we encountered during our research. First, we did not get as much participation as we would have liked due to the nature of the topic being very triggering to some people. Um, next, due to certain delays in our approval, our window to interview and get data was shortened and that we had less time to get the um, interviews done. And then lastly, the scope of the participants was not very wide as it only included women who attended college or university in Virginia. Next slide, please. There are a few strategies that we feel could expand the study, one of which being broadening the focus, either interviewing more students or broadening the subject qualifications to include other groups of the academic community. Both of those strategies would be beneficial. Another is the location of the project. The students that we interviewed were all located in Virginia. Utilizing students across the country would help lend more credibility to the data collected. More locations and universities would make statistics more applicable to colleges countrywide. Uh, the last option that we came up with uh, would be to utilize quantitative data. One issue that we ran into was potential interviewees feeling uncomfortable having the conversation recorded. An anonymous form would be much friendlier to people who want to stay more anonymous with sharing their stories and opinion on the matter. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the studio. Uh, my name is Tyler Hall. And my name is Dylan McKercher and we have decided to conduct our final research project on how athlete activism affects viewership in sports. Politics is a very controversial topic in today's society. Athletic events have always been a platform for the athletes to take a stand in what they believe in. We wanted to see if their activism, or lack of, would influence the fan experience and their viewership of sports. A big reason we wanted to focus on this specific topic is due to our research gap. Last NBA season, the bubble in Orlando allowed the courts to have Black Lives Matter logos and the players to wear uh, words of affirmation on the back of their jerseys and support. And we wanted to conduct a little bit more research to see how this affected viewership. Finally, our research question, as you can see, is how does the inclusion of sports result in lower viewership? Taking a look at our participant base, we had 12 selected participants. 
these had a seven male to five female split with an average age of 26.75 years old, and we had two people of color in our study. Our participants were chosen based off of their participation in either the athletic field or their voice in politics. While conducting interviews, we held eight face-to-face -face interviews, socially distanced of course, and four over Zoom. These interviews lasted between 10 and 17 minutes, and our responses were tracked via a voice recorder app, and then those were then uploaded and transcribed in a private place between Dylan and myself. While connecting our data, uh, we looked for a few common themes. These included repetition, keywords, forcefulness, and either popular or unpopular opinions, which we'll get into some of our results up here next. As you can see on the left side of the screen, we have the first theme of our research. We found that participants were quick to suggest that people who share similar political viewpoints also shared similar stances on athlete activism. Some of our participants were quick to assume that based on someone's political stance, they were for a certain side. We had an example where a participant used the Blue Lives Matter movement as a deciding factor on how someone stands on the athlete activism issue. What we gathered from that is that in relation to our topic was how someone stands on an uh, athlete activism issue. What we gathered from that in relation to our topic was that some sports viewers are full game to watch a sport, but only if people are fighting for a cause that aligns with their beliefs. On the right side of the screen, you can see that the support for political clothing as a way of protest was a theme of our research. You see uniform alterations in so many sports ranging from the NFL to the NBA. Two examples would be the NFL's current My Cause, My Cleat campaign and the NBA's recent allowance of players to wear customized names on the back of their jerseys to support equality. This information is in our research was important because it showed that a good portion of sports fans are more supportive of a passive form of protest rather than an active form of protest. Moving on into our third result that we have, we have naysayers opposed on the field protests. This one was really big because we had some participants that had very strong opinions for this. This included participant number nine who felt like they paid a lot of money to go to these events and the players make enough money for the protests not to occur during the game. They were fine if it was pre-game during their pre-game conferences or post-game during the same thing. Participant number six also went into some detail about protests during games that they were not a big fan of. He, uh, they mentioned that the Jacob Blake walkout during this previous NBA season was one that they were not in the support of because they were being paid to play a game and they decided not to show up for their job. Going off of that, participant number four also went on talking about company time for the people, uh, that the athletes are playing for their organizations and while they're suited up, they should not be voicing their own opinions. However, participant number 11 thoroughly disagree with this. They said that supporting athlete activism was just the right thing to do. This is very relevant because this shows that there are a good amount of people who are opposed to activism on the field and will take their viewership elsewhere. Our fourth and final result that we want to dive into is violence is not the answer. A lot of people are opposed to violence once it occurs on the playing field. Participant number 10 believes that some athletes do not take place in certain acts of protest because of the violence that occurs. And Violence is a big no-go for a lot of people, therefore it takes them out of support. And with our results comes a discussion that can be made on a few points. Uh, on our first question, we asked each participant to conceptualize a photo including former San Francisco 49er Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed kneeling during the national anthem. The results of the question would prompt very great discussion points amongst one another, and there were so many different opinions of the photo and the act at hand. Another interesting finding that we had was for participant number 12. They flat out just said that they did not know enough about athlete activism to give honest answers. They asked for a definition, and then after hearing the definition, they said that they would love to learn more about to become more informed. And also, a big takeaway from our research was the majority of participants who also supported a more passive rather than active form of protest. One might think that this is counteracting their support because passive protesting to most does do very little in comparison to active. The reasons behind why people do and do not watch sports based on politics is interesting to think about, and discussions that could come from that could be very insightful. And some limitations to our research would be the IRB certification delay impacting our interview process. Other limitations include the lack of access to a more diverse demographic of students, both racially speaking and the age ranges playing a role as well. Finally, COVID-19 played a big role in access to people, with Zoom helping a lot with the interview process. Now diving into our future research, one thing that we really want to focus on is small groups. Participant number 10 went into detail about how this is something they would love to see, and we agreed. This allows for a conversation to spark between the people with opposing views, and both sides can interact similar to the YouTube channel Jubilee that does a great job at this. Then we would love to compare sports. While we had some individuals specifically mention the NFL or the NBA, 
getting the likes of the MLB, the NHL, and some overseas sports would add a lot of more detail to our subject. And lastly, we'd love to have a wider participant base. Well, we had 12 participants that all gave some great detail. We had a seven male to five female split. We'd love to see some more diversity in our individuals. And our average age was only 26 and three fourths years old. So we'd like to see if our results differ if you go older or if you go younger. But for Tyler and myself, we would love to thank all of you for tuning into our research on athlete activism and its effect on viewership. Studio. My name is Sam Chase. And I'm Dina Ching. And today our 460 project is on Instagram's partial nude and self confidence. Let's get into it. So, what is partial nudity on Instagram? Well, partial nudity is pretty much anything involving um, posting on Instagram with maybe a bathing suit on, maybe underwear in a mirror. It could really be anything that is not explicitly genitalia being shown on Instagram. Um, it can only be described as media generated to cater to a certain audience or page visitors. So some of the literature that we've actually uh, looked at that have looked into some of these things before um, is um, in objectified body consciousness, body image control and photos, and problematic social networking, the role of appearance control beliefs, uh, that's a mouthful, it was found that in this study there was found to be a connection associated with apparent control beliefs and monitoring body images of the online environment. In our second study, according to sexualizing media use of the self-justification uh, media analysis, uh, exposure to sexualizing media increases self-justification, among others. So how we did this in the methodology, so we did it on a survey that was constructed with 15 gauging participation questions in partial nudity and the self-esteem of our participants. It was sent electronically over Facebook, Snapchat, um, me DMing people and telling them to take my survey, um, etc. So an overall for who took it, we had uh, over 143 people participating in the survey. 96 of them were women and 39 were men. And of the following um, participants that we had, 90 were um, heterosexual 
and the participants were most likely ranged from the 18 to 33 age um, range. The survey asked participants about their self-confidence, how comfortable they were with um, seeing others on social media partially nude, and their content, and how they created their content. Um, the reason for this was to encompass encompass whether those who are self-conscious um, in their postings are more hesitant about what they post on social media, specifically Instagram. So let's talk about our results. Oops. So our first hypothesis was individuals with higher self-esteem will be more willing to post prostitute images of themselves on social media. What does this mean? It's those who are more comfortable with their body image are more likely to post themselves in the partial nude on Instagram. Our second hypothesis was gauging whether heterosexuals or homosexuals would be willing to post prostitute nudes differently. So what it means is those who are straight might be willing to post their bodies more compared to maybe homosexuals or the opposite. So what we found in these hypotheses was for the first one, in our research we found that more self, the more self-conscious the person was, the more hesitant they would be to post on Instagram their partial nudes. The reason for this could be their personal body image and not wanting to display their bodies in that way, whether it's because of the family or their following. Um, and over 30% of those participants had a negative view on their bodies, while only 37% 30 of the participants had a positive view of their body. For the second one, 37.1% of our participants were non-heterosexual and questioning. So without a larger sample, we would not be able to accurately examine whether heterosexual or queer people would post partial nudity to social media. So as of now, no significance was really found to exist when it came to our homosexual participants. So some of the limitations within our survey is, of course, the sample size. We had 143 people who were actively participants in our study, um, and of course, uh, you never know uh, whether more or less will be able to give the same results. Um, over 60% of our um, survey uh, participants were women, so there was obviously a um, uneven amount uh, participating in this. So we wouldn't be able to know if whether uh, one gender would post more or less. Um, the survey construction was also done by me and Dina. We completely made it up as we went. We did not take it from any sort of different survey that we found before in any of our sources. We wanted to make sure that it was more narrow towards what we wanted. And then the variable measurements. The variable measurement is the lack of proof we have from our subjects and their answers. So if we're in the future, if we wanted to continue this, or if anyone else wanted to continue this, continue this re research, a different sample is definitely our biggest one. In the future, more social medias could be analyzed as well as a larger sample size, ranging in all age groups at a college level and slightly above, because they can be posted on Snapchat and other social medias, dating apps, all that kind of good stuff. Other constructs was in the future, more aspects of hum human sexuality and self-esteem should be measured, as well as more specific kinds of nudity, because it's a really broad term. Um, experimental methods, so in the future, homos heterosexuals and homosexuals should be tested equally and separately. In addition, it might prove to be more beneficial to collect data on why they do not post partial nudity instead of inferring why with the data. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Sam Chase. And I'm Dina Chang. And this is our COM460 project.
Hi everyone, I'm Essie Brainin, and this is my research partner, Brainin Jones. And for today, we'll be discussing how young adults are building relationships in a digital age. So what is our research topic? Um, so our research topic is a study of romantic relationships during a digital age. My partner, my partner and I believe that this is an important research because relationships really form who we are and they're ever so changing and how we create them is very um, interesting. Um, for a research app, we weren't able to find many males just because um, we found that a lot of males were not wanting to share their um, online dating experience and they had a lot of perception and opinions on that. Our methodology was pretty simple. We took a look at young adults aged 20 to 24. Uh, most of them were female. We had one male participant and all of whom were Virginia residents. Uh, we contacted them over email and uh, interest forms and we recited a confidentiality agreement statement and asked for consent when it came to using quotes from their transcriptions. Our procedures were also pretty simple. Um, we had interviews uh, on Zoom. We did nine in total with an average length of about 10 to 15 minutes and we transcribed all that data to pull the quotes. Our data analysis was based, um, uh, we developed our themes using three things, uh, repetition, keywords, and forcefulness. A repetition coming from uh, things like ideas, phrases, and experiences, and keywords coming from repeated phrases like friendships or disposable relationships and type. Um, so we had two themes. So one of our themes is the dating app preference. We found that um, many of our participants preferred Tinder just because there was more freedom on that app. Because um, on Tinder, the woman does not have to message first. But um, on Bumble, the woman does have to uh, message first. And our female participants said they really liked Tinder because um, they felt as though when the male um, t uh, messages first that the conversation is a bit more engaging and um, more important. Um, we also found that the size is a very big factor as well, um, with Tinder being 7.83 million um, users and Bumble 5 million and Hinge 1.21 million. Um, so there's a lot more opportunity on Tinder, says a lot of our participants. Um, and this is relevant because um, it shows, you know, where people are dating online and um, which app is favored more than the others. And then now we'll get into our second theme. We have the idea of perceptions. Um, so many of our participants uh, mentioned that the older generations thought that um, dating online was very inappropriate and immature, uh, but the younger generations was more accepting because of this normalcy because they have witnessed people online dating. Um, participants also noticed that the perception that they faced was their physical appearance rather than their personality. More people um, would swipe right on Tinder um, looking at their physical appearance rather than their bio or their personality. Um, this is relevant because um, this, our studies seem to generalize the idea that people are not always um, interested in your ba basic demographics um, and hobbies, but more interested in your physical appearance um, and traits, um, as well as the generational difference in um, the perceptions of online dating. Uh, our third theme is all about how men tend to make the first move. Um, almost all of our female participants noted that they rarely make the first move when they get a match. Uh, participant 7 said, quote, I click on their profile just so I can clear out the notification. I never message first unless I am really interested in who they are and if they seem cool to talk to. Uh, we believe this is relevant because it can help us identify um, a pattern from our data, uh, those relationships and their strength. Um, this came down to, uh, so we asked, uh, most of our participants stated that uh, the only real relationships they made were using dating apps were friendships. Rate their strength of their relationships on a scale of one to five, and the average was about a three. Um, so, for example, quote, I've definitely made a lot of friends off of it, even ones that weren't romantic, but I also had a couple of people that I went on a few dates with and actually had a lot of fun. Um, that's from one of our participants. And we believe this is relevant because it helps us understand what relationships people who use dating apps tend to make. And, you know, keep swiping for much longer periods of time, regardless of how many matches you actually have. Um, women almost always may wait for men to make the first move online. To pass the time, they would often look up their matches social media. They would just clear out the notification and wait to see if they ever got a response or not. Um, and women not making the first move. Um, while we were able to identify some behavioral trends, we ha may have been able to identify...
students 18 and over who attend. For our procedures, we did an anonymous online survey, and it was um, with done with Likert type questions. And we had 28 questions, and it was quantitative data. And then our data analysis: 75% of participants were female. 67% of participants were between the ages of 21 and 23, and 81% of participants were Caucasian. So we had some common themes that we noticed within our data. Um, first included allies. So we noticed that Caucasians identified more as allies than any other race that we ended up surveying. Um, the example that we have is out of the 42 participants who answered that they have interacted with social movement hashtags as allies, 79% of them were Caucasian. Um, and then although people education and awareness, so a majority of the participants strongly agreed that social movement hashtags are educational. Um, an example we have of that is 58% of the participants strongly agreed that the hashtag MeToo movement is bringing attention to an art. Um, so many people are being educated on the importance of topics of a personal connection. So another theme that we saw was that the majority are able to share their stories without judgment. So an example we found in our survey was that 70% of participants agree with the statement pertaining to the Me Too movement. And this is relevant because social movement hashtags have created an environment for people to safely share their stories on social media. Another thing we found was that social movement um, hashtag utility, which interaction and perception of social movement hashtag utility were significantly correlated on a high level at 88%, which means that our data was highly correlated, meaning that someone who interacts with the social movement hashtag, um, the more they interact with it, the more they will, will perceive utility of the hashtag. So uh, interaction and perception of social movement hashtag utility were significantly correlated, as Brooklyn said, at a high level of 88%. Um, the more someone interacts with the social movement hashtag, the more they will perceive utility of the hashtag again. Uh, the survey showed a positive trend on the question asking if participants feel updated on social movement trends, and the surveyors assume this positive trend correlates with the um, positive trend of the question I have learned more about social movements from reading posts on social media that contain the hashtag. So we did find a few limitations um, with our surveying. So our sample population was one, and participants were from a small university in Virginia, so it may not accurately represent the population of users of social movement hashtags. Um, and not all participants were familiar with social movement hashtags or have ever used them. Another limitation was representation. Um, people 23 and over were less represented than people under 23. Um, race and gender are also skewed having more Caucasian representation than any other race and more female repre representation than any other gender. And then another limitation we found was the respondents. Um, some answers that were fill in the blank on our survey um, weren't answered in a serious manner or could have, which could have skewed the data. And then some participants chose not to disclose demographic information, which made it difficult to determine information based on demographics. And then lastly, for future research, we have other hashtags that we would like to look into. So looking into other historically significant hashtags, uh, also focusing on, um, like focusing the survey on people who may find the hashtag significant or have used the hashtag before. So looking out for those people who are actively um, engaging in social movements, um, and then broadening our sample size, which would be reviewing other age groups to see if uh, age plays a role in perception of hashtags. And then also surveying participants um, from more diverse locations besides university students. Um, lastly, platforms, observing trends on various social media platforms and determining whether specific trends uh, favor one platform over another. Um, there's a lot of platforms that use hashtags, um, but which would which would social movements favor, which platforms. Um, and then observing other types of content that are posted with the hashtag depending on the platform. So would that be photos, uh, GIFs, videos, anything along that nature. Thank you. Thank you.
research is uh, our research title is A Poor Man in a Rich Man's World, where the economy is set to favor the rich. I'm Josh Carlton. And I'm Trevor Bowles. And our research topic is on the financial system and the economic inequality in the United States. Uh, this is important because we have record numbers of individuals who are on un unemployment and, po and in poverty, while the rich just seem to increase their wealth every single year. Um, the only research gap we found while conducting our research was that the time period in the research was conducted, we had to wait on approval in order to do our research, um, which delayed the entire research process. We had two research questions. Um, what can be done to fix the income inequality in the United States? And what are college students' perceptions on income inequality? Uh, as far as our methodology section went, section went we had uh, all of our participants were college age males and females. Um, all of our participants were recruited based on if they were currently employed and then they volunteered to participate in our study. Uh, the participants' identities are confidential and have been kept confidential. Um, the procedures that we took, all interviews were conducted over Zoom uh, 101. There was a total of 10 interviews we conducted. Uh, the interviews were around 8 to 10 minutes each and the data was transcribed right after each one of those interviews. As far as our data analysis goes, uh, we developed themes using repetition, keywords, and forcefulness uh, from those interviews. One of the themes that we developed during our research was the lack of knowledge in the economic system. So in asking our participants about the economic system, um, over 90% of the, of the participants had no knowledge of the economic system, which made it hard to um, get the answers that we needed. This showed relevance in our um, research because we advocated for e uh, financial li literacy classes and this supported our research. Um, the second thing that we had during our research were working students. 100% of the students that we did interview are working students and have to work to um, provide for themselves while they're in school. This relates to our data because they show that they have a better understanding of the economic equality from participants who work instead of those who don't work. Our um, third theme where we asked our participants about were they aware of any billionaires um, who raised their wealth during the pandemic and 100% of our participants either named Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. We felt that this was important because it showed that um, not, it showed that um, that they weren't really aware of our economic system, but they are aware of the things that are happening in our economic system, such as people getting significantly wealthy while others are not. Um, the last theme that presented itself is class preference. When asking our participants we asked if they could choose um, what economic class they preferred to live in. 100% of them said that they would either reside in the upper middle or upper class. This shows that they understand the difference between economic classes and um, the benefits that each one holds. And um, for our discussion, we felt that this research was important because we feel that the economic system is flawed and is set up for like people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos to keep winning. The only problem is that people are not educated enough, so complaining and um, wanting change without knowing how to change is pointless because you can't really get much done unless you actually know how to do it. Um, limitations on our project included lack of economic knowledge. Um, participants who participated in our study had very little to no economic knowledge. This made it um, hard for us to get the answers or the data that we desired because they didn't have the, um, the knowledge to give us what, what we needed. Um, another limitation is the number of female participants. We hope to get an even number of um, female and male, but we were, in, we were unable to get over three, so that was a big limitation. Um, the biggest limitation was population size. With a, um, a topic like this, it would have served us better to have um, a broad range of people, but being that we're on a small campus and we're in the middle of a pandemic, it was just hard to like reach out to people and get people to um, interact with us. Okay, so future research, um, 
<clears throat> I would interview other demographics, you know, get varying opinions uh, from people who are in poverty and people who are very wealthy. Obviously, you'll get uh, separate answers. Um, I would conduct focus groups. Participants could help uh, create more ideas and bounce ideas off of each other's heads uh, just to get ba and it's all going to be based off of each other's answers. Um, get knowledgeable participants because uh, our participants, like we've said multiple times, uh, were not very knowledgeable on the subject, uh, but they had strong, uh, strong opinions. And if you have knowledgeable participants, you'll get a little bit better results. Uh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our presentation, authored today by myself, Kent Wells, and my colleague, Jared Wood. The title of all and the results of our study was that ca Caucasians were more likely than non-Caucasians to perceive an accurate representation in both genres. These perceptions of misrepresentation can be caused due to the fact that negative stereotypes are used within the minority identities more often. It's important to understand this because a cultiva cultivation theory tells us that people who watch more television will start to believe these misrepresentations in the real, real world and not just on the screen. The last thing we noticed in our research was perceptions of misrepresentation on television news and reality television were correlated. This means that individuals who claim they see misrepresentation in the news will also see misrepresentation in reality television and vice versa. This is important to understand because individuals who see misrepresentation in these two genres of television are probably also seeing misrepresentation in other genres of television. 
Moving on to this discussion part of our research. The first hypothesis tested whether individuals will perceive greater misrepresentation of their culture on reality television as compared to the news. When we first started this research, we believed reality TV would have more misrepresentations than the news. After the research, we found that this was not the case. Our sample reported more, more misrepresentations in the news than reality television. At the end of our research, we also found that our second hypothesis was indeed true. Cultural and racial, cultural and racial identities play into the count on individuals and perceptions of misrepresentations. Those who identified as white believed their identities were more accurately represented than those um, who did not um, self-identify as white. This tells us that there is a possibility that minority identities are still misrepresented in the media. Although we are happy with our research, there are still some limitations that factor in. First of all, our sample lacked the diversity of the true American population. 61% of our sample self-identified as white. A better sample would also have participants from other parts of the country. This would have given us a better idea of the different socioeconomic perceptions within our country. Lastly, our sample consisted of a very narrow age range. 86% of our participants were in the range of uh, 20 to 23 years old. A lot of these limitations are due to the fact that most of our sample consisted of Longwood students. For future research, we suggest that ac experts examine more genres of television, different, different types of media, and find participants with a wide variety of different identities. We believe this would be best because research will find which exact media platforms contain the most misrepresentations, not only within media platforms, but future research can tell us which identity is most commonly represented in an inaccurate way. Thank you for your time, and we hope you all have a great day. We will be back at 3 p.m. for more presentations.